I uh, just want to share a presentation with you all this morning uh, on how to survive and thrive in an increasingly digital world. So hopefully that's what you're all here for. Um, now, I might be Asian, but I'm really bad with numbers. But I thought I'd start with some stats, right? So some stats around what's changing in the world at the moment is uh, there's currently 4.38 billion internet users, right? billion with a B. 3.48 of them are active social media users, and 3.25 billion of them are active social media users on their mobile. So just to give you some context, 45% um, of the world's population are using social media, and only 56% of the world is classified as urbanized. So you can see just how far and, you know, the social media and technology trend has infiltrated into our lives. And the average user, I don't know about you, but I'm probably on the higher end, but the average user spends about 2.5 hours every single day on social media alone. That's not including things like Netflix or other forms of digital entertainment. Does that sound about right? Yeah? I might be really high. I think I'm probably about four or five hours every day. Um, but what this means is that uh, times are changing, right? Times are changing. And it's not just consumer behavior. Now, I know we're room of business owners, so we're probably thinking about our customer behavior, consumer behavior. But it's not just about what consumers are doing. It's about human behavior and how human behavior is changing. So to finish off this little bit here, um, as we can see, here are some stats around what's happening in the world. I know this is US. Um, this kind of put together on short notice. I was trying to look for Australian stats, but these are US. I think we're fairly, we're better than US, obviously, but we're fairly similar in terms of what we do. Um, we can see that US, uh, the, rate at which people are watching traditional TV or television media, it's dropping. Um, newspaper and print media, revenues in the entire industry has fallen off a cliff over the past few years. Um, and overall, you know, the internet's kind of shot up and everything else is kind of trending downwards. So digital and internet, in case you haven't figured it out, is kind of here to stay, right? Uh, it's gonna be a big part of what we do going forward. And finally, um, Mobile is starting to become really, really big in terms of how we use internet and how we consume media. So what does that all mean for business, right? What do the numbers actually mean for what we're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, it means that it's a bit of a scary time because there's going to be a little bit of change, right? There's unknowns as comes with all times of change. But what it can also mean is a lot of different opportunities, and a lot of great opportunities that we might not have had as business owners before. So I'm gonna be sharing some ideas and thinking around those opportunities today, and then I'll hopefully leave you with something, a bit of a plan that you can implement yourself to deal with or adapt to and thrive in an increasingly changing world. Does that sound good? Yep, awesome. So I'm gonna be covering three ways to thrive in this digital age. Um, now, just before we get to that, uh, you're probably wondering, who am I and why am I speaking about all this kind of stuff? Uh, well, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Growth Lab, which is an online marketing, digital marketing agency. Uh, I've started um, a couple of businesses now, one which is you know, kind of more traditional. It's a stone masonry business, funnily enough, um, and several online businesses. So I've kind of spanned across both you know, offline and online. Um, I'm advisor and virtual chief marketing officer for a few of the funded and high growth startups in Australia. Um, and um, uh, you know, work with companies like Yellow Brick Road, O Media. It's actually pronounced O Media, funnily enough. Um, I've been calling it O for ages, and the CEO pulled me up and he goes, No, it's O Media. Um, and hey, you, uh, amongst other companies around here. So, um, has anyone watched Batman, the, the third one? Remember that scene with Bane when he was like, oh, You merely adopted the darkness, and I was born in it, molded by it? That's kind of like me with the internet, right? Like one of my earliest, earliest memories was um, taking my dad's work laptop, plugging in the dial-up connection, and you're hearing the squeaks as you go through and connect to the internet. Does anyone still remember that? Yeah, one of my earliest memories, right? So I was kind of, you know, growing up, exposed to this very early basis, and kind of grew with the trends, right? Um, uh, what I've been able to do, though, by understanding the trends, is I've been able to speak about this kind of stuff all across the world. Um, so on the, I think it's left, uh, is me in San Francisco talking to other companies about, um, you know, how to adapt the business model to, to online. Um, the middle one was me in Shanghai with a table of billionaires, uh, helping them understand what Facebook means for exporting and international business. And on the right is Vegas. I pretend I was speaking there, but I was just at the party. Uh, <laughs> 
So what I wanted to cover was the three, I call them secrets, um, but really it's, it's a framework, right? Three frameworks of thinking about digital and how you can actually use it to your advantage and really grow your business um, and you know, make your lives better through this online digital transformation. So the first one is the new way of thinking or how can we apply new thinking to what we've been doing? Uh, the second way is what is actually changing? So people make change out to be like this whole big thing where business is, you know, people say, oh, it's going to change everything entirely. Businesses are going to go under. It's going to affect businesses, all this kind of stuff. It's actually not as scary as it seems. I'm going to break down why, and I'm going to give you some tools that you can use to manage that change. Uh, and the third bit is you know, understanding how to move with the times. And you know, there's so many different parts of it. One of the things that we always get asked is, look, there's just so many different technologies, so many different tools. How do we actually build a plan that we can implement easily, right? Without stumbling over ourselves and without you know, having to commit resources we don't have to this. So that's the three steps that we're gonna be going through. Um, and I'll give you some kind of action points from each of these ones. Sound, sound good? Yep, perfect. So the first one is new ways of thinking. So um, I wanna make this a little bit more interactive. So ask you some questions and just shout out the answers, yeah? Cool. So does anybody remember Blockbuster? Yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, yes. <laughs> How about, oh, I guess this is an American example, but has anyone heard of GM Motors? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kodak? Anyone remember the, yeah? I remember taking the little cameras on excursion where you have to wind up the, the cameras and flash them, yeah? And how about Toys R Us? <laughs> yeah? So obviously these businesses aren't around anymore. I um, hope that wasn't a spoiler for any of you, but they've all kind of gone on there, right? Now, I wanted to see with all of you in here, why do you think these businesses failed? So, why do you think Blockbuster failed? Um, videos went out. Videos went out, yeah. Technology. Technology. Um, G to go with the digital market when they had the opportunity. Yep, perfect. GM? GM Motors. It's a bit of a different one. I threw it in there to kind of trip you guys up. Trick quiz, right? Um, how about Kodak? Didn't adapt. Didn't adapt. Yep. And Toys R Us? That's a funny one as well. So with these companies, right, so what it is, obviously there's a lot of different factors. So it's not just the one thing that kind of, you know, uh, moved them under. But with Blockbuster, what it was was a matter of convenience. Right, the internet made life more convenient for people. They could get media and digital um, entertainment online rather than having to go all the way to a store, you know, pick up a, a video, pay late fees, have to give it back. It made things more convenient and they just didn't adapt. Uh, in fact, Blockbuster had an opportunity to buy Netflix back in the early days when they were worth pennies on the pound. Uh, you know, and they laughed them out of the room. They said, oh no, this stuff will never take off. Right, look what happened. Uh, so GM, um, the example of GM and why it applies to, to digital transformation is because they focus so much on their financing uh, and not on the actual product, which is their vehicles. So people online, you know, the feedback loop online started growing quicker and quicker, and people were saying, well, GM cars kind of suck. Now, the problem is, if you're going to sell the financing, you kind of have to sell the vehicle with it too. So that's kind of where they kind of tripped up. They just didn't use the available data to them or customer data and use it um, to grow and to, to mold you know, their company and serve their clients better. So Kodak was the same. They actually had a division uh, or another company called Ophoto, which could have been the predecessor to Instagram. But instead of allowing people to share photos digitally, what did they do? Well, they tried to force people to print their photos that were on Ophoto, right? they could have easily adapted and gotten with the trend, and they probably would have been the Instagram as we know it at the moment. So Toys R Us, um, it's a matter of convenience and control. So they had an exclusive contract with Amazon to sell all their products for Amazon only. Um, and then Amazon came in and started selling everything, and they didn't take the time to build their own platform. So they didn't realize that people shop differently than what they thought they would. Does that all make sense? Yep, perfect. So, Change, now these were some past examples of change, right? Change is happening at this very moment. So if you think about the taxi industry, what's happening with the taxi industry? Yeah. Uber, right? Um, and the funny thing is Uber actually doesn't own a single taxi. Right? It's the biggest taxi company in the world, not a single taxi. The hotel industry is changing. So I hope you guys have heard of Airbnb. <laughs> um, they don't own a single property, yet they're the biggest hotel or um, the biggest accommodation company in the world. Right, and retail is changing at a really fast pace as well. So companies like Amazon, I mean, Amazon only started in Australia. They came to Australia about, I think, 
early this year or last year, but they're changing the way that we show up as well. There's a lot of change coming through uh, in terms of human behavior and how we're kind of interacting with different platforms. So how does this help us though as business owners? Because that's all well and good in theory, right? Like, okay, at a high level, yeah, we're sure we kind of understand what that means. But as people running our business day to day, what does that actually mean? Well, what it means is a lot of good opportunities. So now we've potentially got access to global markets, right? If you were a local business brick and mortar before, maybe you're only selling to your local area. Now you can open up the entire world and find customers from every single country. Uh, you can now get almost instant feedback. So if people don't like your product, they'll let you know, right? If you try a marketing campaign and you know, before you had to launch a campaign, wait for several months, try and see if you can collect the data and maybe you, know, you might know generally if it worked or not. Nowadays you can launch a marketing campaign and know within a day or two if it's worked and iterate and improve as you go. So we've now got instant power or knowledge at our fingertips. So we can tap into databases, we can tap into consumer sentiment. Like all this kind of information is re readily available for us. Um, and we can try new ways of operating and changing the ways that we work for technology with very little impact you know, if you do it correctly on your existing business. So you can try things out and see what works for your business. And if it works, well then keep doing it. If it doesn't, there's very little impact. And you can actually compete with huge corporations out there as well. Um, and I'll show you some kind of tools that we use to do that in the future. Does that make sense? Yep, great. So the second bit is what is actually changing, right? Because change can be a really freaky thing. So here's a timeline of uh, human evolution or when humans came about. So uh, this timeline seems to reckon that we've been about for about, you know, kicking around for 40 to 50,000 years. And the internet doesn't even have a little, or it kind of does, has a tiny little tap at the very end of it. So the internet and digital has been such a tiny portion of human history, yet it's changing so much. But I think from my point of view, and again, I'll try to find some data to substantiate this, but from what I've seen in the businesses we work for, in the ads, in the marketing that we run, even though technology has changed businesses um, a lot in terms of the speed of communications, I actually think that as a species, right, this is getting deep and meaningful, so um, might be a little bit early, need a couple of whiskeys after this. Uh, but as a species, predominantly, we're still very story driven. Right? We told stories to each other around, uh, around the fire thousands and thousands of years ago. We've evolved to always be telling each other stories and that's how we've learned and that's how we've communicated at our finest. Does that make sense? So even though uh, technology has helped us communicate faster, we're still communicating in the same kind of way that we, that we did before. Sort of. I mean, the generation coming up, my kids will probably communicate with you know, abbreviated text and emojis, but that's, an, uh, that's another story. Um, so, how we expect to communicate, so taking that same basis of story-based communications, it's how we expect to communicate that's really changed. So we expect communications to be instantaneous, right? We've got things like Facebook Messenger, text, uh, text messages. I don't know if anyone, um, you know, I still use it a lot, but I'm kind of old school even though I'm on this stuff. Um, but you know, mobile phone, text messages. There's things like chatbots now, which computers can actually talk to you when you're on someone's website. People expect us to also be multi-platform. Right, so it's not just emails that we communicate with. Uh, there's all these different little apps, different technologies that we can communicate with each other. And there's also multi-type as well. So what I mean by that is there's just so many different ways to communicate now. Uh, we can easily communicate via audio. So podcasts are a really good example. They're starting to really come up. There's stories that use audio as a platform or as a type. And there's written, so emails are still huge, obviously. Uh, video, like YouTube, everything like that, and still face-to-face. -face. So I believe that you know, real, human to human relationship is still very much the same. It's just moved onto different platforms and move, moving at a different speed. Make sense? Yep. So given that you know, things are kind of speeding up, well, we don't want to be spending all of our time just trying to keep up with the technology coming in. So the question is, well, what tools can we use to automate or to simplify a lot of what Know, what we think we might need to do. So who wants to see some tools that reprogram for businesses? Yep, cool. So um, don't freak out, I'm gonna explain exactly what all of this does. This is our kind of main little toolbox that we use in our business. And the purpose of every single tool on here is to make it faster to communicate, but also easier for us to communicate with everyone as well. So Hootsuite, uh, it's a social media platform. It means that if we wanna tell a story, we can tell a story across multiple platforms and it pushes out to everything like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and it just does it on the one platform. So that 
hopefully should make life easier in terms of the social media aspect. Uh, we use Facebook a lot, both for advertising and for content. Uh, Facebook Messenger. We use LinkedIn Messenger. It's starting to become you know, okay for, for B2B stuff now. Drupal Intercom is a program that you can use on your website uh, to automate the chat functionality. And you can actually have bots, you know, you can have preset scripts to do it. People just kind of like, you know, seeing that people have seen what they've sent through. And even if it's a bot saying, hey, we've got your message, I'm going to get a human onto it and get back to you as soon as we can. That's really good as well. So we use Drip to kind of do that sort of functionality. Uh, WordPress is where we host our websites. It's really good for change. Uh, ClickFunnels is something that plugs into WordPress. We use it for a lot of our marketing, but yeah, um, that's important. Active Campaign is what we use to automate our emails. So instead of you know, having to, uh, we automate a lot of emails for people coming into the business and communicate and tell the same kind of stories, but I don't have to be there typing every new person coming into our business an email. So Active Campaign automates that entire process. Uh, we use Calendly, so we don't have to go backwards and forwards to find a time to chat. Someone jumps on the Calendly, they can see my schedule and book in the time that works for them. Uh, it's handy if you've got clients across the world as well. Um, Gmail, obviously email is going to be huge. Um, so email, yeah, email, Gmail, whatever you want to use. And then Zoom to facilitate the same relationship building and face-to-face -face conversations all across the world, across different time zones. And you know, it means I don't have to leave the office for days at a time if I don't want to. Um, so in this little stack here, there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different elements, right? a lot of different technologies. So the question is, well, how do we make it more manageable? Because you don't want to go and implement every single thing in your business in the next week because there's going to be issues. So the trick, you know, or a couple of tricks that we've got to make it more manageable, I've actually got two, um, is, well, actually, before we get into the tricks, we're going to the, the, the thinking behind it, right? So the first one is to model it on your lead or your customer journey. Does that make sense? So what I mean by that is think about how the relationship and the conversation with your customers gets built or gets done, and then only use the technology to help that process. Right? So you don't have to use technology just because it's cool or just because it's, it's the newest thing. Think about it from a human perspective. Now, uh, integration and automation is your friend. So if you can automate something awesome, uh, if you can integrate it so you don't have to deal with all the moving parts and move the gears yourself, brilliant. Uh, and that was meant to say get help cheaply, not get cheap help. Very, two very different things, right? Cheap help is never good help, but you can get help cheaply. Uh, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So uh, the biggest advantage of doing all of this kind of stuff, though, is that it's given small to medium businesses the power and the economic scale to compete against bigger companies or bigger corporates. Now, what I want to show you is um, one of the other ways. So you remember how I said get help cheaply? I'm going to show you a way that we've been able to leverage a lot of um, what, what change has brought to our business, a lot of technology, to grow our business and to hire more of the right staff locally, but also you know, grow at a really good margin as well. So this is kind of our organization structure. I've got me at the top. I don't really do much. Um, all the arrows point to my COO, who's amazing, and she kind of coordinates everything, right? She's my local team member. Uh, we've got um, a local web developer as well, a local graphics designer. Uh, but we also have a team based in the Philippines. Because what technology has allow allowed us to do is tasks that uh, traditionally we have a really hard time filling the spots for because no one wants to do it. And the people who do it, they come in and they leave very quickly. So we've been able to outsource all of that to the Philippines uh, for very cheap. And what that's allowed us to do is bring the real talent that we need to grow the business in the right way onshore as well. So we kind of run a bit of a hybrid model. And that's what change has meant for a business like mine, like an online business. It means that we can access cheaper resources from anywhere in the globe and add our value to it and sell that back to the entire world as well. Does that make sense? Yep. Great. So next question, or the final question, is, well, how do we get all this stuff started, right? Where do we actually start? Now, hands up if anyone in this room knows exactly what technology you need to implement, by when, and what exact tools you need to use. Cool, awesome. I was, I was thinking there might be a couple. <laughs> That's awesome though. It's great. So for everyone else who might be going, well, it's great and all. You, you know, looks like there's a lot of opportunities out there. Looks like there's a lot of tools. How do we get started? How do we actually go and take the first step and get things happening to improve our business and to make sure we're on trend um, with how the world is changing? Well, again, it comes back to relationships. 
and being human, right, and building connections and conversations, it doesn't start with technology. So don't look at technology as, oh, this thing is really cool. Everyone's saying it's great. We've got to use it. Because it's not, if you keep following that, you're going to go down endless rabbit holes. So it doesn't start with technology. It starts with people, right? Because ultimately, no matter what you sell, um, no matter what service or product you have, it's person to person relationships, person to person marketing. It's not B2C, it's not B2B, right? It's person to person. So uh, I'm not going to read through all of these. I'll have my email at the end of these slides. So if you want to get these slides as well, uh, you know, feel free to reach out and I'll shoot them straight through to you. But what, are the, what these are, is the questions that we ask in our own business and the business of our clients when they think about what do we need to change or what technology piece do we need to, to make sure our business is current. So these are the, we look at you know, what the product does, um, how the product helps or product or service helps their, their customers, and then build a journey around that using technology to make it either faster or better. So that's the kind of framework that we use. And one of the final points is always ask your customers for feedback, but don't always believe it. So Henry Ford, I think it was, had a really good quote where he said, if I had asked my customers what they would have wanted, they would have wanted faster horses, right? So you've got a lot of data at your fingertips. What we've, we've got, we're in a place where we can ask customers what they want and use that feedback and match it up against the actual buying habits and what they actually do. So we're in a really good place in terms of using technology. Um, and you know, there are opportunities and there are struggles with it and challenges, of course, but there's a lot of great opportunities out there as well. So the final point, um, if, you haven't, if you're looking at the technology piece going, all right, what's the very first step? Well, uh, here are a few things that I think are essential. So a website, you know, if you're in business, you should have a pretty good website, hopefully, uh, but don't do it in the traditional way where it's just like, here's who you are, here's you know, what we're gonna do, right? So Google reckons that most websites have a less than 1% conversion rate, which means 100 people come to your website, look at you, and only one of them does anything with it. So we're leaving a lot of money and opportunity on the table. So I have a website that, again, goes back to the story, goes back to building the connection, and directs your visitors for a, a flow or a journey of what you want them to do. Uh, obviously, make it easier for your customers to buy from you. That example with, with Toys R Us, they just made it so that there was only one way for the customers to buy from them. So don't do the same thing. You know, make sure you've got the right shopping carts. Make sure you're on a few different platforms. Make it easy for people to buy. And then make it easy for them to communicate with you as well. So depending on how you want to communicate, if you're in B2B, you might not want to be sending Facebook messages to your customers. It might be emails. That's completely fine as well. Just figure out how they want you to communicate with them. So to wrap up and to summarize everything we've gone through, uh, there's three new ways, uh, you know, three steps, I call it, to thriving in a digital world. First one is understanding that the thinking that we've had before might not get us to where we want to go in the future. So just being more adaptive and being, you know, being open-minded about the things coming through. So secondly is not being afraid of the change and just understanding that change is going to happen anyway and it's not a bad thing. There's a lot of really, really good opportunities coming through with that. And the third one is having an action plan based on your business and your customers and using that to guide your technology platform or your changes in tech. So um, I don't know if we've got time for questions. We'll take some questions. But if you want the slides or if you've got any other questions, uh, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'm at info at growthlabs.com. Um, no.au, just .com. Cool. Thank you. Great. Questions? Uh, yep. Thank you. One of the people, I'm in the skills area, particularly manufacturing, and most of manufacturing is small business, and trying to get people to go from an analog base where they implement things like sensors and technology and transferring all that information gathering and then putting it to B2B or B2C sort of models is really a struggle. Have you got any advice around that? So do you work for the, so are the businesses your clients or are you working within the businesses trying to transform them? Um, my role is really around advice. To okay. Yeah, so I think it comes back to carrot and stick, right? Um, it's kind of like if you're talking to the people that you want to help, I think you've got to present in a way where the change becomes necessary or they want to do it rather than, oh, we have to do it because we have to adapt. So you want to do a bit of carrot and stick. I mean, I think most businesses out there understand that technology is changing a lot of how we do what we do, 
right? So it's not like um, it's going kind to of blindside us. We know that there's new tech coming through, there's new ways of doing things, there's this disruption every single day. So I think they understand that part. The second part that we've got to do, right, is helping them understand why they should do it now or what, you know, what incentives they have as a business to do it right now. So whether it's cost savings, whether it's, you know, increased revenue, whether it's, um, you know, just more efficiency, staff happiness, I think you've got to take the message back to what the business owner or the business teams need or want um, and then mash it up against, you know, what happens if it doesn't, if they don't change. So it's a little bit different because it's so broad. Um, we run a lot of Facebook advertising. So I think as a company, we've spent about five million, not for ourselves, for our clients, about $5 million over the past few years on Facebook ads. It depends on what your business trying to do. If you're an e-commerce business, the ads look very different to a lead generation business. Um, so what I mean by that is lead generation, you know, if you need someone to pick up the phone and call you, they're gonna look very different to, to, to someone selling a $20 widget online. Uh, the biggest trend we've noticed um, on the lead generation side, I don't do a lot of the e-commerce stuff myself, but the lead generation side is stories. So we write really, really long ads. You know the ads that get you to click on see more? Because what that does is, first of all, it builds a story, it builds a connection to the people reading it, and if Facebook goes, oh, everyone's clicking on the see more, so this must be a really interesting or an engaging ad. And so your ad costs are actually cheaper and they show it to more people. So it's all about how can you engage them in your story? Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? And uh, do you use Facebook remarketing at all? Yeah, re remarketing is the most successful part of our campaigns by far. So we, um, we remarket on Facebook and Google and any other network that we can find. Yeah. Cool. What do you think is the most powerful platform? I tried to find you on Instagram and I couldn't find you on Instagram. <laughs> Um, so most of, so no, I actually, it's funny because my business is built a lot on social media, but um, I, I do have an Instagram account, I do have a Facebook account, I use it very sparingly, because uh, it gets, like, there's too much distractions for, for me being on, um, being on social media. I just get into real rabbit holes and start arguments with people online, which isn't what you want to be doing, right? Um, so we use, or I use Instagram and Facebook only for advertising most of the time. Um, but Instagram, it, it's one of those platforms where I think it's still, for, depending on what business you're in, if you're in the online coaching space or you know, selling fitness products and supplements, it's a great space to be in. For every other business, I don't think it's quite mature yet. So our um, thinking in terms of social media and what platforms we're on is where are our audience or where are our, um, our ideal clients on. So we're a, a very B2B business, so I'm heavily on LinkedIn. I'm um, starting to, and we do a lot of advertising on Facebook all the time, but LinkedIn's where it's at for us. So, so can you effectively do those long 2,000 word sales letters as well on LinkedIn as you can on Facebook? No, so LinkedIn for us, it's about, um, so it's kind of two different things, right? LinkedIn advertising is not quite there yet. Um, so we use Facebook to advertise. We use LinkedIn just to get more content seen. It's a branding experience. Whereas Facebook is a direct marketing experience. So for Facebook, every dollar we put in, we want to get five to $10 back. And if it doesn't, we're looking at the campaigns going, what, what's the metrics? Where is it falling over? Whereas LinkedIn is more like the brand building experience where I'll shoot a video and we'll just push it out to, to the public, uh, to the audience that I want to. And we will get some stuff, we will track it, but it doesn't track as well as Facebook. Thank you so much. Oh, no worries. I don't have to. You, all of the platforms really seem to be um, pushing product out or for um, content. Um, and uh, the four companies that you mentioned who went under, who couldn't see the crystal ball or didn't understand their customer needs, yep. um, what, um, what would you see as a, um, a platform to store customer details and data and understand, um, you know, try to understand the customers and where they're going in the future? Um, that, that was the one thing I, I didn't see in all of your um, products. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the reason why I didn't have it in there, it's, it's a separate piece by itself. So 
back in a previous life, I used to be, uh, I used to run IT teams um, based around CRM systems and, and data, looking at data business intelligence. Um, so that's a difficult question because of, it depends on the scale of the business, depends on what data you need from the customers, and then how you're going to analyze the actual data itself. Um, so, you know, there's so many good systems out there. Salesforce, for example. Um, I think Microsoft's investing heavily in their business intelligence and data platforms as well. But again, it, for me, it's not about the technology. It's about, first of all, will the business use it? Because that's one of the biggest struggles you, you'll have. You know, how do they use data? What meaningful insights they get from it? And how does that translate into the rest of the business? Um, and the second point is, you know, if they're actually going to use it, well, how are they going to use it? And you know, what needs they've got? So there's a lot of different data systems, CRM systems. Um, I think I used to say pick one that's industry specific to what, what you're doing. So there's, you know, there's real estate CRM systems, there's manufacturing CRM systems and ERP systems. But nowadays, they all do a pretty good job. Um, it really, that's a you know, bit of a question where you've got to spend some time analyzing what you need and what the technology can do and mash it up. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. I just wonder though whether to get to that level of sophistication where you're able to accurately um, put your campaigns together to mm. a particular group set, yep. you have to understand them first. So it's not the first part of the work of the business is to in implement that understanding of the customer need through the CRM. It, it, the, again, I think it depends what business, because um, you know, some businesses, the owners will have an, already a good intuition about what the customers need, because they've been in business for a while, right? They've been in business for a long time. They might be operating out of Excel documents, but they've got some good business knowledge. Um, in this day and age, if it's a newer business or if they're trying a new product, instead of what we look at as well as you know surveying um, and using the data that we've got in the business is just launching it straight to market so spend five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars whatever the budget is and just see if someone will buy it because as i said you know we there's using the data and asking people what they want and there's actually going out to the market and seeing if that actually flies so data is super important um, but you know we like experimentation as well we like moving fast as well That's a really good question. So to bring it back to the, the same kind of point, I think there's a lot of fear in that the nameless corporations will be taking our data and using them in not the right way. Um, if you're on Facebook, that's probably what they're doing already, so kind of late to the game, right? Um, Facebook probably abuses our data a lot. Uh, but in terms of reaching out and building that trust with your customers and your leads or you know, prospects where they actually do trust you with their data and their money and their time, I think, uh, the humanization aspect is super important because if you can, even if it's at scale where you have a video and you talk about your business, you talk about yourself, people connect to that. So if they connect to you as a business owner or they connect to your message or your goal or vision as a business, I think they can, you can build trust really easily by using that vehicle. So it's about you know, how much trust can you build with the people you're talking to versus their fear. I think that's what it is.